Thank you, everyone, for coming today. I apologize for the slight technical delay. I, the PowerPoint, I know when it's often when people see PowerPoints, they're like, oh, yawn, time to sleep. But the PowerPoint that I have here is entirely images. So that's why it took a while to download. Um, uh, and I thought in partnership with all the yammering I'm going to be doing, some visuals would be mildly entertaining for all of you today. Um, so the title of my talk I'm going to share with you today is why I love selfies and why you should too, damn it. Um, which, and that, that, that parentheses was edited out when we uh, did the public uh, <laughs> posters. Um, and the subtitle is a challenge to the negative discourse on selfies and the potential for or of online self-imaging. Um, so I'll give you a little lowdown on what I'm going to talk about today, but before that I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out today and also thank Paul for organizing this and, and, um, and for Diane and everyone in arts for inviting me to be here today. Uh, this is really exciting for me. <laughs> um, I know it sounds, I think this is, students have told me that uh, they, they like they, some of the, some of them some of them like my lectures because I really geek out in front of them and you're going to see my utter geekness come out when I'm talking about selfies today. So uh, my my outline for you today this is my like little mini lecture plan. Okay, I'm going to tell you what the definition of selfies is, which I'm sure people have a general idea of what they mean. I'm going to tell you why definitions suck in general. Okay, I'm going to recap what you've been told about selfies through mass media uh, in general. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you why you've been told those things. Okay, we're going to pick that apart. Um, then I'm going to make you contemplate everything that you see around you. Uh, then I'm going to propose that selfies offer us a new way of seeing, which is different and interesting. And then I'm going to propose that because of that, perhaps we can recontemplate our perception of what selfies are. And then I'm going to take a selfie with you, and then I'm going to let you go. All right? And my two arguments of why you should stay is, are both, they're both reasons why you should stay, but also kind of like little disclaimers. I'm going to show you some paintings of naked ladies. So if that is offensive to you, you can close your eyes or you're allowed to leave. I'm also going to show a photo of James Franco with a shirt off, which also might be appealing to some people. It also may be offensive to some people. So those are my little disclaimers, all right? <laughs> Not offensive at all. All right, here we go. So this is um, the definition of a selfie, and I'll read it here. A photograph that one has taken of oneself, typically when taken with a smartphone or webcam and uploaded to a social media website. So this was the definition that was... Um, created by the Oxford Dictionary, um, and it was inaugurated into the Oxford Dictionary last November, um, both uh, as a new word, but also it merited not only sort of the inauguration into the di dictionary, but also it was named Word of the Year by Oxford uh, Dictionary last November um, because of its social and cultural pervasiveness. Now, I want to do two things with this definition. I want to point out the two important elements of this definition that are uh, necessary for my research in particular. And then the second thing I want to do is I want to point out the limitations of this definition and, prior, and more broadly the limitations of definitions in general. Okay. Um, so the two elements of this definition that have proven to be important to me and my research are first the front-facing camera and second the distribution of images through social media. Uh, these two variables are what make selfies different from other earlier media uh, of self-imaging. First, no other medium uh, until digital photography permitted you to see yourself in real time on a front-facing screen. A mirror lets you see yourself but not record your image. Okay. Uh, with smartphones or digital cameras on a pivot screen, you have access to a te technology which is at once a mirror and a visual recording device. Because of this, you can watch yourself move and at that perfect moment, nab the image that you desire. Additionally, the selfie is different from previous self-portraits because the end product is not an image to be captured and shared privately uh, or maybe distributed to a handful of relations. Uh, but rather, the selfie is produced with the intent to be shared broadly through social media outlets like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Tumblr. And so the selfie 
is different from previous self-imaging technologies because it's at, it, it at once is, a, is reflection and recording as well as public and private. It's at the same time a recordable mirror and a billboard. The second important note I want to make about defining a selfie is the limitation of Oxford's definition, or I'm going to talk about this, of definitions in general. Okay? Oxford provides a definition that I'm going to call human in nature. By this I mean that it provides kind of like the operational building blocks for, to analyze selfies. Take away any of the components of the definition that we looked at before, and your photo becomes less of a selfie, right? Um, I have an image here from a photo booth. Take a picture of yourself with your, you know, of yourself with, by yourself or with friends um, that isn't distributed through social networks, and it's just a self-portrait. A self-portrait taken by someone apart from oneself is a portrait. Among social media users, a selfie of a specific body part or various subjects or goals also yields differentiating uh, uh, subgenre hashtags, right? Like belfies, wealthies, healthies, shelfies, ugly selfies. This is my attempt at my ugly selfie here. Um, and Kim Kardashian's famous belfie or back selfie or butt selfie. Um, and so the building blocks are good. Right for definitions, they're good, they, but they tell us nothing about the meaning of selfies. Right, so this was st really the starting point of my research: was what do selfies mean? Why do we see them everywhere? But before we get even into that, my real, real starting point was to question definitions themselves. Okay, rather than starting with the Oxford definition or the news he headlines that were occupying Twitter about selfies, I wanted to look at selfies in their most simple form. Okay? Devoid of any of the annoying social talk or words or the language that had flocked to and reinforced this specific negative discourse around selfies. Okay? I wanted to di criticize this discourse because often language clouds meaning more than it clarifies. Okay? To borrow an idea here from Jacques Derrida, words really are poor stand-ins for reality. Okay? Words can really only do two things really well. Okay? Um, and this is a term that, that Derrida came up with, différence, which is a combination of the two French words, différence, A and C, E, and différence, E and C, E. So he said, words can differentiate words from other words, right? And words can defer us away from reality and towards just more words, okay? So it's sort of words just spiral into other words and they sort of remove us from reality. Derrida's definition reminds us that if words are poor stand-ins for reality, then definitions, which are just strings of words, are equally or could be equally poor stand-ins for what is really happening out there. Okay? Um, and if we depend on the definition of selfies that exists out there, the meaning that we're told to believe about selfies, then we start to believe that selfies look something like this. Um, do people know of this video by the chain smokers? It sort of went viral around the web a few weeks ago. It's, uh, I, I won't subject you to the video here, but it's basically a music video of these two girls um, with some like super heavy beats in the background. And these girls are talking about very superficial things about, oh, this girl's at this party and you know, what's she doing here? And then at, at, at every sort of moment of interlude, they say, but wait, let's take a selfie. And so they're you know, taking pictures of themselves, always with the backdrop of both being in a bathroom, which is the common backdrop of selfies. Um, so if we believe what we're told by mass media about selfies, then this is our definition of selfies. Selfies are narcissistic, right? Selfies are the products of a self-absorbed populace. Selfies are vanity rituals of the me, me, me generation. Selfies are made by people, mainly girls, and that's my focus for my research is on girls because they seem to be the most prevalent producers of selfies. Um, so selfies are made by people, mainly girls, so lacking in self-confidence that they seek through social media constant validation for the, from their peer group and beyond. In short, traditional mass media outlets have woven a story, a myth maybe, what postmodernists would call 
truth, very persuasive truth claims telling us that verging on sin, selfies assuredly mark the demise of civilization as we know it, as we know it and they cause head lice. Thank you, the province. Or at worst, death atop a moving train. Um, this past week also I've been seeing that there's increasingly uh, instances of aligning uh, the discourse of selfies with discourses on mental health related issues. In particular, this story that came out of London, uh, a teen who attempted suicide, um, who, and I'm going to paraphrase sort of at the way that this article was presented, but it essentially sort of presented it that um, this teenager in London, who, who, de, who uh, his depressive state was apparently solely caused because of an inability to take a sufficiently attractive selfie. So discourse theory and analysis is an important field within communication studies for us to include here because it's often associated with the postmodern turn in communication theory. So I'm going to describe some of the theory in more detail for people who aren't in communication studies, just so we're all on the same page here. So discourse theory takes roots in philosophies of these kind of people, okay? We've got Ferdinand de Saussure, Mikhail Bakhtin, Roland Barthes, Michel Foucault, and Julia Kristeva. So these people were what, what are called po structuralists and post-structuralists. And what they generally argued is that lacking first-hand experience with the world out there, a predominant way we come to know about the world out there is through language. Okay? In my classes, I often describe or illustrate this this way. How many people in the audience have ever been to Antarctica? Okay. How many people in the audience are pretty sure that Antarctica exists? All right. So, my point being that many of us are quite convinced that the world comprises of realities that we, in fact, have never experienced firsthand. The only way we come to know about these realities is through words and images provided to us by mass media, right? And other ideological institutions, education system, what have you. Post-structuralists furthermore argue that language is not just a benign carrier of information. It's not like a vessel that you put information in and it just floats it to the next person. Right? They argue that language itself shapes how we come to understand uh, the reality that exists out there. A post-structuralist approach argues that to understand a structure like a word, right, it's necessary to both study the structure itself and the system of knowledge that produced that structure. So for instance, who were in powerful positions in the process of defining a word? And what ideological preferences did those people hold that could have influenced the process of defining a word? Okay. An easy example of this would be the political correctness movement, which attempted to change commonly used words in order to manage some of the power imbalances inherent in the structure of language. For instance, changing words like fireman to firefighter, or policeman to police officer. These former words illustrate how words themselves uh, not only car carry information, but they also shape how we think in very subtle ways, right? These words that I gave you examples of here, fireman, policeman, um, and in the gendered suffix man, right? Which harkens to a time when men predominantly were the exclusive gender permitted to hold these professions. And now these words act as sort of subtle reminders or echoes or ghosts of a history of male privilege and patriarchy in our society. To avoid a whole lecture on semiotics, which is the discipline from which post-structuralism arose, I'll speed things up a little bit here, okay? So, the base unit for semiotics uh, is the sign, or the word, at the bottom, okay? Words form statements, statements form discourses, and discourses eventually form the stories that make up history. This is what post-structuralists would argue. Or, as post-structuralists would argue, the hegemonic talk that establishes the dominant memory of societies. That memory also forms the basis of rationality and reasoning within a society. But I'm going to come back to that in a minute, okay? So to be sure, the dominant discourse is, put simply, the dominant way we come to talk about topics of social or cultural interest or concern perpetuated by mass media. For instance, the talk that is, that is predominantly surrounding selfies associates them with narcissism, self-absorption, youth culture, and either the lack of confidence or the overconfidence of youth culture. Discourse does not come from thin air. 
okay? But rather, as Foucault pr proposes, he was one of the guys on the previous slide, dominant discourses perpetuate dominant ideologies, which in turn perpetuate dominant discourses, which in turn perpetuate dominant ideologies, which in turn perpetuate, you see where I'm going with this. So if you place that lumbering circle on a timeline, um, you have the trajectory of how a post-structuralist might argue history is recorded and remembered. Okay? When we turn this wheel back, okay, I want today to narrow our focus on my area of research, which is young women and self-imaging. Okay, so young girls and selfies. By looking at the history of visual mass media similar to selfies, you begin to see a dominant and deeply rooted set of ideologies that has shaped our understanding of women imaging and self-imaging historically. Capitalism, male privilege, and patriarchy, Freudianism, and the Christian sin of vanity, I believe, are ideologies that all play a role in the reason why we are told to hate selfies so much, and in particular, hate girls who take selfies. So in this analysis, I want to provide some insight to discuss how this type of image is similar and yet very different from this type of image. Okay. So I'm not going to go deep into this history. I'm going to sort of just dip our toe into it. So let's start. If we turn that discourse ideology wheel back in time a little, we can look at the influences of, and ca of capitalism, patriarchy, and Freudianism on the presentation of the female form in advertising. Okay? Discourse from Freudian psychology strongly influenced motivational researchers like Ernest Dichter in the 50s to tap into women's so-called innate biological desire to be looked at and praised by men and other women. Similarly, in 1929, Christine Frederick's influential home economics book, Selling Ms. Consumer, and her extensive work in American advertising after that, suggested that there were 18 female biological motivational instincts, which among them included love of style, jealousy, ostentation, and vanity. Apparently, ladies, it's genetic. We want to be looked at, or so goes the discourse. Turn the wheel back further, and we can look at how male privilege and patriarchy influenced images of the female form in painting. The female form was presented as many things, according to Marsha Mix Gimmon. Um, quote, the female nude displayed in painting, sculpture, and fine art photography and graphics has come to connote beauty, wholeness, and in many ways, art itself. Women's bodies are more often meant to be universal metaphors for masculine desire, creativity, and culture. The female body is either nature, titillating object of the gaze, traditional role model, for instance, daughter, mother, or wife, or some combination thereof. As elaborated by, as elaborated by John Berger in Ways of Seeing, more often than not in classic art, the female form is presented passively to be gazed upon, often in a reclining position and not active in her pursuits. Turn the wheel further back and we could look at how discourses related to the Christian sin of vanity surrounded the invention and expansion of flat mirrors in Venice and their distribution throughout Europe. It was feared that this new reflective technology would encourage vanity amongst women. It's kind of weird for us to imagine the invention of mirrors because they're so prevalent, right? But this once upon a time, what it was like to, you know, for mirrors to be a new imaging technology, okay? It was feared that this reflective technology would encourage vanity, especially amongst women. French moralist Jean de Carreau's, uh, and this is a quote by him, um, rallied against the practice of women wearing mirrors at the girdle because it became very fashionably, uh, very fashionable for women to have a small pocket mirror and they would wear it on a belt. Um, and they began to wear them in places like at church. Uh, and uh, Jean de Carreau uh, chastised this. Um, and in this quote from uh, a critique that he, he, a public critique he wrote, he likened the practice of a woman wearing a mirror on her belt to that of a prostitute. Uh -huh. Many of the earliest artistic renderings of the sin of vanity portray uh, a woman at a mirror preparing her face. In fact, the visual iconography of vanity is a long history of being presented as female. For instance, the image of vanity in Caesar Ripa's Iconoglacia of 1645 is a woman in a flowing dress, 
Arms open as an invitation to be looked at. She has her heart on a plate on her head, as if vanity at its worst is praising the physical self without any other goal. Think of the connotation of the word vanity today, right? It's either a synonym for being self-absorbed, or it's a feminine piece of furniture with a mirror at which you put your makeup on. So we continue to turn that wheel back, and what we begin to observe from a historical vantage point forward is a history of ways of seeing, or ways of looking. And in particular, the history of how we've been taught through various visual media to look at the female form, or for women, how we are to present ourselves to be looked at, and when it's appropriate for us to look upon ourselves, in short, goes like this. Here's the rules. Women are to be looked at, but they cannot look upon themselves unless it happens in private. Women are to beautify themselves, but not openly praise their good looks. They can be in front of other looking eyes, but they can't be in control of the lens. The discourse above laid out the ground rules, and the accompanying visual culture reinforced these rules as law. If post-structuralists explore how words from the basis of how we communicate and come to know the world through language, then I'm proposing that the study of selfies reveals a sort of visual post-structuralism that encourages us to analyze how historical conventions of visuals, images, and icons have taught us not only how to look, see, and interpret the world around us, but how to look, see, and interpret ourselves. So my next point is, if there is a dominant way we've been taught to look, how, what does that look like? Okay? How have we been taught to see? So the dominant way we've been taught to see reflects the mid-1600s writings of René Descartes in his treatise, A Discourse, where he, found, where he famously you know, said this, je pense donc je suis, I, I, I think, therefore I am. Descartes uh, did not explicitly in this treatise lay out a theory of seeing how we see. Um, but visual theorists like Jen Doi argue that Descartes' deeply influential propositions to separate mind from body led to a sort of Cartesian ontological turn, which Doi calls Cartesian perspectivalism. Okay? It's argued that images we surround ourselves with on a daily basis teach, teach us falsely that we see with a disembodied eye. Okay? This disembodied eye surveys the material world like a neutral and mastering spectator, where objectivity, matter, and subjectivity, thought, are divorced. Although elaborated in the 1600s, Jen Doi argues that Cartesian perspectivalism remains what, is, what Doi terms the dominant scopic regime of the modern era. Okay? Susan Sontag also reinforces this idea in her book on photography when commenting on the scopic traditions of North American and European art photography and photojournalism. And this is a quote from her book. Gazing on other people's reality with curiosity, with detachment, with professionalism, the ubiquitous photographer operates as if the activity transcends class interest, as if the perspective is universal. Sontag continues to propose that the gaze adopted by professional photographers is either that of scientist or moralist, where, quote, the scientist makes an inventory of the world and the moralist concentrates on the hard cases. But to me, both of these perspectives are from an outside looking in. One perspective is removed and unemotional, the scientist, and the other is authoritarian and morally conclusive. The disembodied eye continues to pervade visual culture in mass media today, and because of it, we in turn look, learn to look with a disembodied eye. The objectified bodies of women in advertising evoke no feeling in us. Right? We don't look at them, like this ad, and think, who is that girl? Who is that lady? Photoshop erases any semblance of what Roland Barthes calls the punctum in the photo. These photos don't emotionally prick us or affect us like other types of photography. For instance, a picture by Vivian Mayer. We don't look at mass media photos with heart and soul. We look at them with our eyes only, just like we've been taught to in the tradition of this disembodied eye. The news photos of Crimean protesters 
shot using photojournalistic conventions repeated decade upon a decade are unaffecting to us. They are protesters, like any other group of protesters. We don't even think to try to embody the horror of having one's territory threatened. We're not supposed to. We've learned to adopt the perspective of the removed photojournalist, to look at the people in the image as figures and objects, who are, as Sontag put it coldly, visually interesting. The disembodied eye floats around us in mass media and we adopt it, partly because of conditioning, partly perhaps to survive the increasing ubiquity of visual culture. But I don't want to make it seem like our eyes have evolved into these unaffected robotic cameras for every type of photographic image. Okay? If I were to end the lecture now, everyone would just leave like, <sighs> like crying. I want to remind ourselves of visual post-structuralism for a second. Okay? We can take solace in the fact that this disembodied eye or this disembodied way of seeing is a learned way of seeing. Although we may be conditioned to see mass media photos with predominantly a disembodied eye, as that is how mass media sees the world, selfies and amateur photography online, I believe, are proposing new ways of seeing that challenge the strength and popularity of Cartesian perspectivalism. These images, selfies and amateur photography, are more like images from a photo album. And thanks to the broadcasting power of the internet, these images are now reaching us with equal force as traditional mass media. And so how do we see these types of images? These images are encouraging us to remember what it's like to feel an image and not just see it. And so to illustrate this, I'm gonna pull myself completely out of theory and tell you a story. In the midst of all this sort of theoretical contemplation and writing, I took a step back, so never ever so critical of this disembodied, objective sort of standpoint. I started to worry that I too was becoming too deeply buried in theory, and I was losing track of what selfies really were, okay? which to me was self-reflection and the process of sharing self-images. So I sat back and I thought, if I'm studying self-imaging, let me start by studying my own self-image. Okay? And the next thing I thought was, I need a mirror. So my kids have a mirror in their bedroom. Uh, it's one we inherited from my partner's parents. It's got this fancy gold leaf frame. And I mounted it in their closet about five, minute, five inches off the ground, very low, so that the kids can look at themselves. My daughter, who's one and a half, and I positioned ourselves in front of the mirror, me cross-legged because it was so low, and her is standing beside me. And I looked at myself. Immediately, I remembered a powerful painting by Joan Simmel, probably one of my, becoming one of my favorite paintings. Uh, this is a painting called Me Without Mirrors. In the image, Simmel paints only what she can see with her own eyes. Only to what she can see with her own eyes. The positioning of her gaze implicitly challenges the external and often disembodied gaze of the, of the painter, right? It also challenges the notion that if a painter isn't present, then mirrors must be used to properly see oneself. A mirror image, like I'd suggest, is suggested, is like a word. It's just a copy of reality, and often a poor copy at that. I wanted to look in the mirror and see myself in this powerful way that Simmel's image was encouraging. But in front of the mirror, I automatically became critical of my self-image. I saw little wrinkles beside my eyes and they were sm they're, you know, smile wrinkles. I realized it had been a while since I had intently looked at my own self-image, long enough for a few more of these little wrinkles to appear. Uh, when I looked at those wrinkles, it made me think about my age, but then I started playing with them. I'd smile and they would draw back like theater curtains, and when I relaxed, my mouth and my wrinkles would relax too. I saw a scar from a persistent teenage pimple which then evoked memories of sitting in front of mirrors like this one as a teen, scrutinizing my face, right? Every pore, every eyebrow hair from this maximum close proximity. It was a memory filled with emotion. I even remember the frame in the bathroom mirror in the house I grew up in in Ottawa. It was similar to this gold frame, but it was painted a high gloss black. I felt compelled to put my hand out on the mirror and my fingers touched the image of the fingers in the mirror. 
the mirror was cold, uh, and my fingers were cold when they touched the image as well. I skip, this is my high school image, and there's my fingers on the mirror. Um, as I looked at myself stewing in feeling, memory, nostalgia, theory, body, mind, senses, right? My daughter, who had been playing contentedly and oblivious to the mirror, suddenly caught sight of my image in the mirror and with an enormous smile said, Mama! And she leaned into and kissed the image on the mirror. And then she turned to me and kissed me. And then she turned back to her own image in the mirror and kissed her image. Up until recently, classic mass media of mass communication have consciously or not perpetuated the scopic regime of the disembodied I, which encourages us to separate body from mind and I from being. We don't often protest because up until the sweet combo of social media and handheld photographic devices, the average person was no match against the visual ubiquity and domination of images produced by and distributed through mass media. We could look at our own image, we could photograph ourselves, but we couldn't broadcast it, and so we couldn't challenge the dominant scopic regimes on the same playing field. Now we can, because we hold ca the camera ourselves, and because we're taking a crap load of photos. What selfies invite us to do is see through different sets of eyes. And being forced to see through different sets of eyes forces us to reflect on our conditioned way of seeing. When I see selfies as girl, of girls, I don't see them as objects as I do the mannequins and ads. I see these girls as people. I see them as humans. When I look at a selfie, it looks more to me like an image from a photo album or a yearbook than it does a news photo from a photojournalist. In fact, I think this is why the selfie of Zokar Sarnev, oh, there we go, this image, <laughs> of Zokar Sarnev on the, one of the accused Chicago bombers was so impacting on the cover of Rolling Stone. I saw not a disembodied, not one of those typical disembodied mug shots of a potential killer, right? But a soft, filtered, nostalgic photo of a young man, a human. There's even a visual poetry to the arm's length nature of selfies. The arm which often acts as a sideshow to the photo. The arm holding the camera reaches behind the handheld camera and in so doing places us, the viewer, between the camera and the subject. Softly breaking the fourth wall, we are wrapped within the arm of the image taker. Whether we know the subject of the photo or not, there is a forced intimacy. Come here, says that arm. You're part of this as well. The selfie is a visual embrace that draws us closer into the relationship with the image and thus the image taker. When girls take selfies, they aren't being narcissistic. They are negotiating. They see themselves as they've been taught to be seen by the learned scopic regimes of their childhood. They pose to be looked at, a hair flick here, an over-the-shoulder gaze there, they assume the upward gaze and the diminutive position uh, the camera has told them to have, right? They may pose mimicking these visual conventions that they've learned from ads, photography, and painting, but they don't do this without thinking, feeling, and negotiating. Because they are the ones holding the camera now, the girls in these photos aren't simply presenting themselves as bodies to be looked at. They are, presenting themselves at, they are not presenting themselves as disembodied objects. With camera in hand, these girls are learning to see themselves differently. And these are some of the quotes from my, the first stage of my research. Um, and I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to read through the quotes, but I'm just going to tell you what sort of the summary of my findings so far has been. With camera in hand, these girls are learning to see themselves differently. They're playing with conventions. They're trying on different identities. They're performing. Some girls who take selfies are using the camera as a sort of therapeutic technology to recognize the learned ways that they are taught to present themselves, but then also to perhaps recognize the mythology of those idealized images. Um, 
and this, this quote, I will read the first quote here because I think it really sort of illustrates this point well. This one girl said, I see the photos of girls in magazines and when I take a photo it makes me kind of sad because I see that I'll never look like that. But then I keep taking photos and eventually I find one where I think I look good and that gives me a boost and that's the one I post. And finally, many girls when taking selfies are using the lens to talk and say what they want to say, but not through words. They're talking with their physical and emotional person, in their skin, in a place, and showing the range of their being, for better or for worse. Selfies of girls are not photos of disembodied objects. Selfies of girls are images of embodied subjects. When I say that I'm studying selfies, I often get a few chuckles. Sometimes I have to pause and say, no, I'm serious. I'm studying selfies. Um, but what perhaps I should be saying is that I'm studying how dominant ways of seeing are being challenged by new media technologies like selfies. I'm studying online visual culture in order to explore how new technologies could be opening up opportunities to see the world around us in different ways. My research is interested in how emerging visual communi communication media could encourage a diversity of ways of seeing the world, a diversity of ways of seeing one another, and perhaps most importantly, a diversity of ways of seeing ourselves. And that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> That's the end. Any questions? Any thoughts? How many people here take selfies? Yay! Now you can say it like with pride. You're like, yeah, I take a selfie. I'm gonna take a selfie of all of you with me in it. Do -de do -de do Smile. <laughs> no duck faces. There we go. <laughs> Any, any questions or any thoughts? I'd love to hear what people think. This is my first sort of iteration of getting everything that's been churning in my head out. Yeah. It's funny because um, for our life circle of friends, what's more prominent now is the guy is taking the selfie. Yeah. Not even the mirror pics, but like little pics like, like this, like, oh, I'm in Montreal or I'm on the, in the airport. Yeah. So it's weird how that's kind of, and how men aren't supposed to be that vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I find that really interesting too. And I, I'd like, if, for my research, I'd love to kind of like, you know, I'm starting with girls, but then the next group I'd love to look at is like how how young men are taking photos. I I, I totally see that as well. The, um, you know, when selfies began on Instagram women predominantly we were doing these hyper close-ups of faces often from that like I was saying that sort of like uh, you know upper perspective of the camera to like lengthen out the neck and that sort of thing and guys would do the reverse this low shot or the peck shot you know the like I'm in a bathroom here's my six pack um, or it's them doing things and I think there's also something really interesting to kind of look at in that too this sort of history of you know like women as passive and men as active and it's sort of you know I, men if they're taking a picture of themselves it has to be them doing right on top of a mountain with a backdrop traveling these types of things so I think it all plays into these various discourses of what is permissible in terms of self-imaging of women as well as what is permissible of self-imaging of men as well absolutely and not just women and men, but, you know, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Any other ideas? Yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I can... Oh, really? See, everyone in, in like art, history, and fine arts, I need to talk to you because my whole background, I, I, I'm like, you know, when I was going over the, 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 my, my little toe dippings into art history, I, I did it like sweating up here <laughs> because it's so not my discipline. But like, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you guys are here because I, like, I need you <laughs> for those, those uh, areas of the research that I really like to get into, but I know I'm going to have to spend a lot more time than what I had up here, right? Yes. As the artist who I am. Yay. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what I find really interesting is some girls are cognizant of it, but from a very short history, you know, it's they literally will say that the girls that I talked to, I rip out a picture from a magazine. I I saw, it, some of them have said, like, I've seen them not just in sort of pop cultural references of advertising and what have you, but that whole trajectory of the presentation of the female form I find so interesting because it is this kind of, you know, the images we see now of women is erases that whole history, right? Which I think is really important for us to discuss. Yeah, especially with the girls holding the cameras. It's one thing just to replicate what they've been taught, but it's another thing when it's really challenging, you know? Like, that's why I find the, 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 um, the trend of the ugly selfies really interesting, because it is kind of challenging. Well, I mean, it's challenging in a head, you know, total reversal, like kind of reversal of aesthetic norms, the, the taking a picture of yourself at your worst versus taking a picture of yourself at your best, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Right, interesting. We need to we need to chat. <laughs> we need to like merge our brains. <laughs> Any other thoughts or no? All right, well thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it.